Hey, what's going on, church? Welcome to Calvary. My name is Daniel, and I am so excited to have you join us today for our online service. We are all about seeing Jesus famous in our lives, and what that means is that we are just making him glorified in everything that we do. So if you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. Go ahead and text the number on the screen, and we'd love to reach out to you and get you plugged in. So let's go ahead and prepare our hearts for worship today. Let's pray together and let's jump right into it. Father, we love you and we are so thankful to be a part of your plan. We are so thankful to just be living our lives for you, Lord. We're just so grateful for your sacrifice to us, God. And as we take this time to worship you, we just ask that you center our focus solely on you, God, nothing else. To just remove the distractions around us, God. And we can just solely focus on you and your love and your goodness and your grace, Lord. We thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. And we just commit ourselves to you right now, God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's worship.
your body, the wine your blood, sweet communion, you set a table for us, all the crucified Jesus, no greater love than the bread your body, than the wine your blood. Jesus, our Savior, oh, just to know you in your suffering, just to get closer than I've ever been, oh, we will remember. I'll sing the holes. in your hands the wound in your side 39 lashes brought me back to life and before resurrection there was a grave in hell there was a battle where my life was saved oh we will Jesus, our Savior, oh, just to know you in your suffering, just to get closer than I've ever been, oh, we will remember. Oh, sing, Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, our Savior, look at Him, look at Him. Jesus, our Savior, look at Him. Jesus, our Savior, look at Him, look at Him. Jesus, our Savior, oh, sing Christ our Redeemer. Christ our Redeemer. Look at Him, Christ our Redeemer, look at Him, Christ our Redeemer, look at Him, look at Him, Christ our Redeemer, oh, we will our Savior, oh, just to know you in your suffering, just to get closer than I've ever been. Oh, we will remember Jesus, our Savior. Look at Him, look at Him, Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, our Savior, look at Him, look at Him, Jesus, our Savior, see Christ, our Redeemer, Christ, our Redeemer, look at Him, look at Him, Christ, our Redeemer, look at Him, Christ, our Christ our Redeemer, look at Him. Oh, 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 we will remember. Oh, 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 Jesus our Savior. Oh, just to know You in Your suffering, just to get closer than I've ever been. Oh.
Well, thank you, Jesus, so much for the great sacrifice that you offered on the cross. Your body, your blood sacrificed for us. You paid the penalty that we should have paid. But thank you that in your generosity and in your compassion, you chose love. You chose sacrifice and you chose redemption. And with this gratitude in our hearts, Lord, we want to dedicate our tithes and our offerings back to you. As we give, help us to give with this understanding of what you've given to us. Help us to give from a place of joy and cheerfulness and gladness. We love you and we commit all that we give to you and for your glory. In your name we pray together, amen. Amen. Let's continue to sing. Well, let's sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Yes, we live for you oh, Let's sing his name, sing Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Oh, sing us together again. Sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Sing worthy. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Sing holy Holy There is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me our prayer today. Sing, I will build my life. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I Shaken, I will build my 
beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those around me Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those around me Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining Calvary Monterey in this way. Today we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles. If we have never met before, I'm Nate Holdridge and I've been the lead pastor here at Calvary for the last 14 years. And I'm just so pleased with what God is doing and so glad that you could be a part of it today. Hey, we're in a study where we're thinking about the theology of work called wholehearted work. And this is our third teaching in this series. And today we're going to think about how to do good work. And we'll think about this from Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 22 on into chapter 4, verse 1. Let's read it together. Paul writing says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Father, we pray for our time in the Word and ask that you would teach us, Lord, how to use our energy well so that we might do good work, whether we're working in our home, whether we're working in a workplace, whether we're working at school or whatever it might be, we pray, Lord, that you help us to work well by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 1 Kings chapter 19, one of the greatest prophets in Israel was looking for his replacement. Elijah was worn out from years of feeling like a lone voice against the sins of Israel's monarchy and Israel's people. So God raised up a man named Elisha to take his place. Now when Elijah went to Elisha to recruit him for the work, Elisha was busy plowing a field with a pair of oxen or a yoke of oxen. When Elijah offered the job to Elisha, Elisha quickly said goodbye to his parents, sacrificed the oxen right there in the field, cooked the meat of the oxen with a fire that he made out of their wooden yokes, gave the meat of the oxen to the townspeople and arose and left with Elijah. As I've been preaching these sermons on work, perhaps you've daydreamed about a similar end to your job, an abrupt end, burning it all down. Peace out, I'm out of here. Now, of course, I'm joking, but this is precisely the attitude that many Christians have about work and even the world as we know it. They are only looking forward to departure. But can't Christ redeem our lives today? Can't Christ redeem our work today? 
Can't he infuse them with meaning and purpose? I think he can, and this text points us in this very important direction. Now, the passage that we're looking at is addressed to a group of bondservants in the Colossian church during Paul's day. These bondservants were slaves. And well, it's true that the form of Roman slavery that they were under was closer to indentured servitude than the horrors of the African slave trade in our nation's history. Don't let anyone tell you that the biblical form of slavery in the New Testament era was easy. The ideas and implications of the gospel eventually saturated the empire enough to abolish this form of slavery, but in Paul's day, it was still a strong institution. And Christians needed guidance on how to work in these terrible conditions. And because their situation was difficult, Paul's guidance to them on how to do good work should also ring true to us. If his exhortations could help them in such a difficult situation, then certainly his exhortations can help us as we work in our free economy. So what did this passage show them and what can it show us about how to do good work? Well, the first way that this passage tells us how to do good work is by number one, working for your master in heaven working for your master in heaven. This concept is scattered throughout the whole paragraph that we just read. Paul starts by telling bond servants to fear the Lord instead of earthly masters. Then in verse 23, he said the fear of God is the way that they should operate. The fear of God, of course, is a concept that means to revere God to stand in awe of God, to respect God, and ultimately fear a life contrary to and void of God. Then Paul doubled down on this concept by telling us in verse 23 to work for the Lord and not for men. He went on to say that we should see our work in verse 24 as a way that we are serving the Lord. And he even reminded the authority figures in the churches, the, the, the masters, uh, that they had a master in heaven to whom they must report. Now, in the first teaching of this series, we thought about how Jesus came with a kingdom and how we are representatives of his reign here on earth today. In other words, our work should be done as if King Jesus commanded us to do it. Here in this passage, Paul codifies that message. Rather than see ourselves as doing our work for our earthly employers and, employ and, and authorities, we must believe that we are doing our work for King Jesus. Now, none of this meant that the ancient slaves that Paul wrote to were to stop working for their earthly masters, just as None of this means that we are to stop working for ours today. What it means is that the visible authorities of our lives, bosses, employers, leadership, they all have another authority behind them. We're to see through them as Christians and through their imperfections as Christians to see Christ and his perfection. We're to see our work as being done for our master in heaven. And I hope you see what's happening here. Christ is being presented in this passage as the redeemer. Not only the one who comes to redeem our spiritual self, not only the one who comes to redeem our future eternal self, but the one who came to redeem our actual, tangible, physical lives today. You see, when God first created man, and we thought about this a couple of weeks ago, he put man in the garden to tend it and to cultivate it. That first instance of work was meant as a way for man 
to enjoy God and his creation. But sin marred the beauty of work. We became separated from God. And work, as a result, lost its divine touch. Man no longer worked as a form of worship, but began to work for mere survival. But when Jesus comes into your life, he redeems everything, including work. Now, our work can return to a semblance of the worshipful atmosphere originally intended by God in the Garden of Eden. Will it be perfect? No, not yet. But can it be done for and in his name? Absolutely. And this brings a bit of life back to even the most mundane or frustrating work environments. Now, one of the most beautiful byproducts of this mentality, this mentality that your work is ultimately for your master in heaven, is that it protects you from getting your identity from what you do in your work. This is an inevitable temptation of life for many of us. Some of us spend so much time preparing for and carrying out our careers that it becomes easy to make work our identity. I remember years ago, there was a truck commercial that latched onto this theme. The truck owner was at a backyard barbecue and someone asked him, what do you do? And his mind began to flash, not with images of his work, but to images of dozens of adventures that he went on with his truck. Camping, rock climbing, off-roading, the implication was that his identity was not in his job, but in his lifestyle. And of course, his truck brand was very happy to sell you a bit of that lifestyle. Never mind that you'll mostly use that truck to go pick up groceries at Costco. Sexy. Now, some of us might think of a commercial like that and think, that's a good message. I'm not what I do for work. I'm so much more than that. And that is true. You are. But your work is an important part of you. It's a gift that you're called to give to the world. It's a mark that you'll make on society. And the man in the commercial, he simply found his identity wrapped up in his hobbies and his personal interests. Good things that can never be God things. So instead of trying to find your identity in something other than work, I'm adventure guy, or I'm workout guy, or I'm fashion guy, or I'm movie guy, find your identity in Christ. And because you're working for Christ as your master in heaven, know that your deepest identity is in him, and he asks you to work in his name. Now, Paul also expected this mentality of working for your master in heaven to destroy two things. He said in verse 22 and 23 that it would destroy eye service and men pleasing, which you can blend together. But we know exactly what he's alluding to. It's working in a way that calls attention to yourself with improper motives. It's work that is done only to catch the eye of the boss. It gives effort only when under supervision. This is a people-pleasing mentality, and it's a cancer to any workplace that it's found in. But seeing Christ as our true master in heaven, the one that we respect and worship, it should eradicate uh, the sin of I service and men pleasing from us. Why? Well, because Jesus sees us at all times. He's always with us and he can always weigh the quality of our work. Allow me to give a brief pep talk before moving on to this next point. Our Lord and our King, Jesus has commissioned us as Christians to work well. He wants students that name his name to study hard, to be honest, and to give their best. 
He wants employees that name his name to work hard, be diligent at all times, and add value to their organization. He wants employers who name the name of Christ to be just and fair with those that they lead. And he's watching our lives. He's evaluating our work. Don't let life pass you by by doing subpar work. Do not be a people pleaser who only does what they can to give the impression that they're a good employee. Don't cheat your work by spending time on your phone, wasting time online, or kicking back while you're on the job. Don't come into work underslept and unmotivated. Don't bring a bad attitude into the workplace. Christ is on the throne. He is your king, and he demands more from us. We are working for our master in heaven. But the second way that this passage shows us how to do good work is by telling us to work with the right heart. By working with the right heart. In the Old Testament, there was a story where God selected David to be the next king in Israel. And when he did, he sent his prophet Samuel to David's house, the house of Jesse, David's father. When Samuel saw David's oldest brother, he was really impressed. He thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Here's the firstborn. He must be the chosen one. But God, as we know, had other plans. And he rejected all seven of David's older brothers and then said to Samuel, the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. This inward glance is God's way. God is always concerned with our heart motivations. He's always concerned with the drives of our hearts. And in this passage, he tells us we should work heartily with a complete sincerity of heart. What does this mean? Well, to work with sincerity of heart means that we are to work with pure and undivided motives. Our mind, our inner motivations should not be in the workplace a mixture of good and evil. Instead, we should genuinely and earnestly have the best motives for our work and workplace. And to work heartily in whatever you do means that we put our whole heart into our endeavors. If we're in school, we give it our best. If we're in the workplace, we give it our best. If we're working in the home, we give it our best. To work heartily is to, to approach your work with enthusiasm. The Christian who wants this, who wants to be genuine and enthusiastic in their work, they're striving for excellence. Philippians says, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The genuine and enthusiastic Christian worker understands this truth. They set their minds on excellent work. They will not punch the clock or do the minimum. They believe they are created in Christ Jesus for good works. So they work as if their job was one of the good works that Jesus had in mind. Now, some of you might feel overwhelmed at this point. Your work is not easy to be enthusiastic about. And your heart is not genuinely interested in what you're being paid to do. Now, we already considered how believing our work is for our master in heaven can help revitalize our motivations. But for you, I would also recommend the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. My encouragement based on this statement from Jesus is to begin going through the motions in your work of showing genuine interest and enthusiasm for your work and watch 
what happens. Jesus said, wherever you put your treasure, your heart will follow. My prayer is that the motions will turn into emotions. And soon you'll find yourself with a sincere joy and a real passion for your work. And this biblical attitude of zeal or intentionality or um, enthusiasm or unmixed motives, it's a biblical attitude, but also a helpful attitude because it's the key to much advancement in the workplace. Someone who is disinterested or disengaged from their work is never the first choice for promotion and fresh opportunities. They're not attractive to other prospective employers either. Many employers and leaders are looking less for aptitude and more for attitude. We can learn most of the skills required for most of the work we need to do, but a good attitude that's hard to find. Without a sincere heart and genuine enthusiasm, we will find ourselves stuck, more than likely, in the same job forever. But with that enthusiasm, doors begin to open. Let me also point out that if we are to work with the right heart, then the spiritual disciplines can have a positive impact on our work. What do I mean? by that. Well, your work would benefit from the spiritual discipline of solitude in many ways. While you're alone with God, God will recharge you for the work that you're to do with others. He'll give you clarity on projects and initiatives as you separate yourself and get alone with him. And he will quietly prepare you to have faith and trust in him with your work and in the workplace. Solitude makes you a better worker than those who never take time to slow down, think problems through, and become calmed by the Spirit. Your work would also benefit from the spiritual discipline of Bible study. When you meditate on Scripture, your mentality and character are shaped by its truths. Each day, you'll be repointed to the larger truths about your coworkers, about your truest mission, and the authority figures in your life. Scripture makes you a better worker than those who listen to fad voices, pseudo-Christian pontificators, or divisive commentators. Your work would also benefit from the spiritual discipline of fasting or the spiritual discipline of generosity. I couple these together because they both involve personal sacrifice, doing something that hurts a little bit. People who practice these forms of self-denial become good at doing hard things. This will make you a better worker than those who regularly practice avoiding pain at all costs in their lives. Your work would benefit also from the spiritual discipline of Christian fellowship. Christian friends will point you to Christ-likeness when all you want to do is complain about, sabotage, or underperform in your workplace. Christian fellowship will make you a better worker than those who are constantly listening to immature or ungodly advice on how to navigate workplace dynamics. And your work would benefit from the spiritual discipline of regular church engagement. When you habitually gather with your church, you're refocused on God. God is constant. God is reliable. God is eternal. And connecting with him helps us endure the frenetic, unpredictable, and temporary nature of work. Regular church engagement will make you a better worker than those whose entire well-being rises and falls with their ever-changing work successes. And lastly, your work would benefit from the spiritual discipline of Sabbath rest. When you take a day each week to enjoy God and his creation and key relationships, you will be energized for the week to come. Sabbath rest will make you a better worker than those who go hard all weekend 
and use the work week for recovery. So the spiritual disciplines and all of the Christian life and truth are beneficial to our work. When we neglect our walk with God, we dry up. Going to work without abiding in Christ means we're giving our workplaces the worst version of ourselves. Instead, we should press into Christ and watch how he transforms us to bless our workplaces. So allow the spiritual disciplines to help you work with the right heart. But the final and last way I want to show you that this passage tells us how to do good work is by number three, telling us that we should be working for the ultimate reward. We should be working for the ultimate reward. Now, to make this point, I need to impress on you just how shocking the truth Paul proclaimed would have been to his original audience. As slaves, the workers that Paul wrote to did not expect to receive the reward of an inheritance from their masters because they were only servants to the household and not members of the household. They did not qualify for the inheritance. But here, when Paul wrote to these slaves, he said they needed to know that from the Lord, they would receive the inheritance as their reward in verse 24. How could this be? Well, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we who are far off are brought near by the blood of Jesus. We are now, the Bible says, adopted as sons and daughters of God. And we will receive the inheritance of Christ because his blood has brought us into God's family. Now, simultaneous to the joyous truth that Paul declared was a sobering one. He said, the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And since there is no partiality with God, even masters should treat their servants justly and fairly. The idea that Paul is communicating here is that God will both reward his people and judge sinners. All Christians, both those in authority and those who aren't, should work as if they will give an account of their lives someday. They should work as if there's a paycheck behind the paycheck, the one coming with Christ at his return. Now, it might be odd for you to think of Christ's return in this way. Perhaps you've been thinking of Christ's eternal kingdom as a place that all disparity will be wiped out, total equality of positions and possessions. But the New Testament doesn't seem to paint that picture. Jesus said that when the master returns, he will give charge of 10 cities to some and five to others and none to others. First Corinthians says that on that day, the fire will test what sort of work each has done. And if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. And 2 Corinthians says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or bad. Ephesians says, whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's a bondservant or is free. First Peter depicts God as ready to judge the living and the dead. And Jesus said, the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of the Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Now, none of these verses mitigate the gospel. We get to heaven by the blood of Jesus, but once there, we will give an account for our lives, and God will, according to his word, reward us accordingly. I think these rewards will be gracious and we'll all be pleased and satisfied. But here, the bond servants are told to work with that eternal reward in mind. 
And I pray that this truth, that we should work for the ultimate reward, will motivate us to reverse engineer our lives. What I mean is that we should think more deeply about the brevity of life. Just like Pastor Manny taught last week from Psalm 90. And how to design our lives in the light of eternity. And one way to reverse engineer our work is to work with a stewardship mindset. If Christ has entrusted a level of opportunity, resources, and abilities to you, you must steward them well. If you're a leader, work hard to become a better leader. If you're a parent, work hard to become a better parent. If you're a student, work hard to become a better student. Whatever opportunity you have right now, be faithful with it until the day that Christ returns. Joseph's story in the book of Genesis inspires us to live this way. Uh, just to remind you, Joseph was the youngest of all of the sons of Israel. But God gave him dreams that one day he would rule over his brothers and even his parents. But when his brothers heard of these dreams and saw the favoritism that their father showed Joseph, jealousy drove them to fake his death and sell him into slavery. Suddenly, the dreamer was in Egypt, far from home, and enslaved. What did Joseph do? Well, he trusted God, and he worked as hard as he could for his new master, Potiphar. It came to the point that Potiphar didn't even know what he had in his bank account. He had grown to trust Joseph that much, and Joseph's presence did nothing but bring blessing on the entire household. After a false accusation from Potiphar's wife unfairly landed Joseph in prison, Joseph responded just like he did when he was sold into slavery. He served, he worked, and God blessed everything he did. Soon, the prisoner was running the prison. Finally, Pharaoh invited Joseph into his courts one day because he heard that Joseph could interpret dreams. And Pharaoh needed an interpretation for two vivid dreams. Joseph, who'd had two vivid dreams of his own many years earlier, gave the interpretation with God's help and ended up serving Pharaoh for many years. The son who became a slave and then a prisoner became the second most powerful man in the world. But Joseph did this by being a faithful steward of whatever opportunity God put in front of him. I don't think he was happy about each situation he was put in, but he didn't grumble either. Instead, he prayed and went to work, asking and expecting God to use him despite his circumstances. And as he stewarded his opportunities, Joseph kept his mind on the future reward God promised. He never forgot the original dreams that God gave him. How do I know that? Well, when Pharaoh asked Joseph to interpret his two dreams, Joseph said, the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. What faith Joseph had in that moment. We might have expected him to say, after over a decade in slavery and in prison, something more like the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that God is going to take his sweet time if he does anything at all. But Joseph didn't think that way. He was clinging to the future inheritance God said he would receive. And I believe that if we are going to work well, we must have a similar faith and outlook. One of my favorite stories in the Bible from the life of Christ is when he raised Lazarus back to life. That guy was a goner. His death, his funeral, his burial, they'd all uh, already occurred. And when Jesus commanded them to remove the stone from the tomb, 
Lazarus' sister objected. She said, Lord, by this time, there will be an odor, a great stench, for he has been dead for four days. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life, so he insisted. And out came Lazarus with linen burial strips unraveling from his body. What was dead is now alive. Perhaps our passage today can have a, have a similar effect on your work. You might think it's sucking the life out of you. You might think there's no life in it, that it's dead. You might even think it stinks. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He's the great redeemer. And his life can infuse life into your work. God created work before sin entered the world to be a joyful experience before him. And Jesus' gospel makes a way for our work to be raised to that life-giving level once again. Seeing work the way that this passage describes brings life back to the workplace. Instead of working for human authorities who will inevitably discourage and disappoint us, Christians, this text tells us, work for Christ. Disappointing employees or discouraging employers cannot totally bring us down because we know that at the end of the day, we're serving Jesus. Instead of working with disingenuous motives and apathy, Christians can work with genuine zeal and enthusiasm, this text shows us. Even the most mundane tasks become fresh and exciting because we see them as acts of worship to our good Lord. And instead of working only for material reward today, Christians work for the eternal inheritance that will come with Christ's return. Even meager rewards and pay push us to look beyond to the better payment that is coming with Christ. So I hope this passage has helped you see how to do good work. God bless you, church. Have a great week. Hey, church. Here are a few ways to help you dive into community and stay on mission this week. On Wednesday, May 25th, we will be hosting a wholehearted work meetup here at Calvary. Work is difficult, but having a Christian brother or sister in the same industry can help you through fellowship and your work experience. The hope for this meetup is that we make connections with other believers that can help us look for prayer, encouragement, and solidarity as we navigate our work lives. So don't count yourself out if you're a tired or a stay-at-home parent because there will be groups for you too. Childcare will also be available for those who pre-register. You can register at calvary.com events. We're excited to partner with David Joannes and his ministry, Within Reach Global. David and Within Reach Global have a passion to connect Christians to evangelistic opportunities in unreached parts of today's world. Today we have a special video from David to share with you about this ministry. Hello everyone, what a joy and honor it is to be together with you today. I'm excited to tell you about some of the things that are taking place among unreached people groups where I've been working and living uh, among for the last 23 years, specifically in China for where I spent 15 years, Thailand where I've been here for almost nine years now, and in Myanmar. You know, we founded Within Reach Global uh, many, many years ago, over 23 years we've been serving those who have no access to the gospel. We'll go into villages and say, in Mandarin Chinese, have you ever heard of Jesus Christ here? And I have heard the most amazing responses. People have no access to a Christian, a missionary, a church. They've never seen a Bible, never heard the gospel at all. In fact, one man said, is that a brand of a soap? As if I was some sort of international businessman trying to monopolize on the soap industry in Southwest China. <laughs> it sounds silly, but also tragic. Tragic that a lack of gospel access is the greatest injustice known to humankind. And what do I mean by that? 
When the gospel does not take root in our hearts, when we don't abide with Christ, he in me, I in him, his values and desires and kingdom rubbing off on who I am as a person, um, that's when we begin to welcome or accept an anemic uh, gospel into our midst or the idea of, of being a Christian without any responsibility of sharing it or simply going through life, uh, you know, going to church and going through the motions, but not intimately spending time with Jesus. The places that I've gone, people don't have these opportunities. Um, you know, as I think about America, we've had gospel access for as long as we can remember. I mean, our country was began uh, as a sort of people fleeing from religious persecution amongst other things. And we have had that gospel. And yet, you know, we're still struggling in our culture in this day and age with the culture wars of the day. I mean, you have everything from war and race, gender issues, creation care, moral relativism. What does that say? We, we've had access to the gospel, yet we still struggle with all these things. If a lack of gospel access is the greatest injustice to humankind, then why aren't we as a community, as a, as a nation, thriving in every aspect? Perhaps the case is that we have allowed an anemic, a soft, maybe therapeutic gospel into our midst. I believe that Jesus has dreams and desires for something greater than that. The robust gospel for which we were created uh, has got to come alive in us. And that comes from spending time with Christ. Again, I in him and he in me. You know, Matthew 24, 14 says this. I'll say it in Chinese because I've always loved, I learned this in Chinese uh, before I learned it in English, I think. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to every nation, people, tribe, ethno-linguistic group. And then what happens? The end will come. When we have the privilege of access to the gospel, when we have gospel privilege, it, it requires it, it requires a responsibility, a duty, a, a desire for sharing that with others. In fact, the culmination of all of history. Let me read this to you. Revelation 7, 9. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. And it goes on. But we get a picture. We get a picture of the end of all the ages, the culmination of the ages. Um, over the last 23 years, we have seen over 95,000 gospel encounters with people who have never heard, had the chance to hear the gospel hearing about Jesus. Through that, many, many hundreds and even thousands have come to faith in Christ, gone through our discipleship process at Within Reach Global. Uh, 75 churches have been planted in China, Myanmar, and Thailand, and we have eight outreach centers in the region here in Southeast Asia. Our desire is truly to take the robust gospel, the gospel that Jesus meant it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and what else? Love your neighbor as yourself, robust gospel, and hand it over and give access to those who are still waiting on the, on the other end of our obedience. A famous quote by A.B. Simpson said, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. And for many people in this area where we've been working, uh, it has never arrived. They have never understood the good news. I believe we have been called as a people, as a community, as followers of Jesus to take this great gospel privilege of knowing that our sins have been washed away and we become new creations in Christ, seated with him in the heavenlies, and tell others about this gift. Amen. Uh, this is the gospel privilege we have. And I pray that you would pray with us and walk with us and journey with us at Within Reach Global to see that 
every citizen in God's kingdom is significant. And as we raise up new believers, baptize new disciples, send them forth into their own villages to, to make more disciples, that's what I want to see, the glory of God covering the earth like the water covers the seas. You have a part to play in this. And I would encourage you to pick up this book, Gospel Privilege. This is the recent book I, I wrote, uh, The Unearned Advantage That's Meant for Everyone. You can find it on Amazon or at gospelprivilege.com. Uh, I, I know Calvin Monterey has been supporting Within Reach Global. You have been sowing hard-earned money into this ministry for many years. We are so grateful for that and thankful for that. Um, but I believe there's more. I'm not talking financial. There's more for you to see the specific a thing that God has fashioned you for to make his name known among the nation, to extend his kingdom to places it has not gone before. So again, what a joy, what an honor it is to share with you very briefly uh, the things that have been taking place. I wish I had time to tell you about John Rome and Yellow Jesus. By the way, all his stories are, are in this book. Incredible uh, ways of showing the incarnational ministry of Jesus among people who have never heard of him before. Uh, I just want to say that we love you. We pray for you regularly. We are so thankful to link hearts and hands for the sake of those who have yet to hear the name of Jesus. Uh, if gospel, if a la lack of gospel access is the greatest injustice known to humankind, Let's become champions for those who are waiting at the other end of our obedience. May God bless you, and I hope to see you soon. David's books can be found on Amazon, and his ministry can be found at withinreachglobal.org. For more information about what's going on at Calvary, please visit us at calvary.com and sign up for our weekly Calvary Connection. God bless.